Now what I'm going to be preaching on tonight is actually a very, um, I think a very important doctrine, a very fundamental doctrine of the faith. And the title of my sermon is The Blood Atones for the Soul. And this is, you know, it's, it's, a pretty, it's a pretty basic concept, but, you know, we need to make sure that we're hitting core doctrines of the faith. Not every service is going to be like some brand new thing. I mean, it ought not be. Maybe if you're brand new saved, you've never heard things from the Bible before, it's going to be all brand new. But we need to make sure we're grounded and cemented in great truths of the Bible that are very, very clear, very, you know, we can't let our guard down and just kind of overlook things and not teach on them and not look at them, and not study them and learn from it. There's a lot to learn and, and you'll be amazed at how much you can actually learn if you just think, oh, well, I already know this and just kind of turn your brain off. You're going to miss something because these great truths are very profound and very deep and usually carry a lot more meaning if you just let yourself open up your heart to the scripture and, and see. And oftentimes I've noticed um, when, I've, when I was the one sitting in the pew, there's things that would come to my mind and I would learn that weren't even necessarily main points of the sermon or even a point made in the sermon. But as you're listening and being attentive, you know, the Holy Spirit will work within you and kind of make other verses pop in your mind and, and you learn great valuable truths that way as well. So, um, we're going to dig into this tonight. And one of the reasons I'm bringing it up too is because if we focus too much on any one thing, especially where there's an area of doctrine under attack, we need to make sure it's all still balanced and in the proper view. So lately I've, you know, I've preached on the, the fact that Jesus Christ's soul went to hell. Right? And that is a fact. No doubt about that from Scripture. I think I proved it very handily from Scripture that that did happen and that Jesus, was, it wasn't like he was just lounging in hell and not experiencing anything of hell other than just, just, just being there or just preaching or something. Um, it, I think that's very clear from Scripture. But we don't want to take that point and... and over magnify something that the Bible doesn't talk a, like a lot about. Now, it's, it's definitely clear doctrine. But if you're going to compare, you know, what Jesus did for us and you look at something like his soul going to hell, yes, it's mentioned. Yes, it's there. Yes, it happened and it's true. But look at what actually atones for our sin. The Bible is very clear that it's the blood of Jesus Christ that atones for our sin. And the way that we look at it is everything is necessary. Everything is required. When we look at everything that Jesus did, his perfect life, his sinless life, that was, that was necessary. That was required. His death on the cross, the way that he died, that was required. His, his body being broken and, and you know, whipped and beaten and blood literally being shed for us on the cross, that was extremely important. That had to happen. His soul descending into hell. That was important. That had to happen. The resurrection, of course, that had to happen. Extremely important for our salvation. The resurrection of Jesus Christ coming back from the dead. The ascension into heaven. And what we're going to be looking at today, the sprinkling of the blood on the mercy seat in heaven. All important things that needed to happen. So, we're going to look specifically at the blood and just a little bit about the, the blood is, is an amazing, an amazing subject, even just, just humanly speaking. Let's, before I, I don't want to get ahead of myself. Look at, let's jump down here and read in verse number 10, where we just read in Leviticus chapter 17. The Bible says, And whatsoever man there be of the house of Israel, or of the strangers that sojourn among you, that eateth any manner of blood, I will even set my face against that soul that eateth blood and will cut him off from among his people. God is very serious about people who would eat blood. Now, don't get worried when the Bible says like eating blood. Eating is just consuming with your mouth. So it doesn't have to say drinking blood, but that would cover drinking blood. Okay. 
And that's what it's referring to is just is just eating the blood and not letting the blood run out when you kill an animal. Now, just also so everyone understands this, if you eat red meat, people will say, oh, do you want your, how do you want your steak cooked? Oh, I like it bloody. That's not blood in the meat, just, just, just so you're aware of that. Because some people don't know that. Some people are kind of confused. They think that that's blood. You don't have to be grossed out about eating, you know, meat that's, that's kind of red. That's not blood. That, that Joe's juices, it turns red, yes. And I know blood turns red too, but, but that's not the case. Blood would actually be a lot thicker, blacker almost for, you know, in a dead animal, especially one that's been dead for that long. Um, it's not blood. But we are commanded not to eat blood. And you think about, you know, blood's being transported through the body anyways, through your veins and other things. It's not necessarily just, just in the middle of meat. But um, in any case, the Bible's serious about not eating blood. But why is that? Well, it tells us in verse number 11 why God is so serious about people eating blood. He says, for the life of the flesh is in the blood. And I have given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that maketh an atonement for the soul. And there we have a very clear statement in Scripture about what needs to happen for atonement to be made for our soul. Atonement, a good way to understand just the word atonement is at one mint. It makes us at one again with, with God. When we become a sinner by, by understanding law and, and, and choosing to break God's law, we are, I, I hate using somebody's word, but separated in a sense from God. We, we are in a state of not being in good standing with God and we need to be reconciled and made at one again. And the way that that happens is through the shedding of blood. Of course, when we put our faith in Jesus Christ, it was his shed blood that covers our sins, that paid for our sins, that makes the atonement for our soul. Um, continue reading here, verse number 12, the Bible says, Therefore I said unto the children of Israel, No soul of you shall eat blood, neither shall any stranger that sojourneth among you eat blood. And whatsoever man there be of the children of Israel, or of the strangers that sojourn among you, which hunteth and catcheth any beast or fowl that may be eaten, he shall even pour out the blood thereof and cover it with dust, for it is the life of all flesh. The blood of it is for the life thereof. Therefore I said unto the children of Israel, you shall eat the blood of no manner of flesh, for the life of all flesh is the blood thereof. Whosoever eateth it shall be cut off. Over and over again, we're gonna, we see this, and we're going to see in other verses as well, that the Bible's talking about the life is in the blood. Life is in the blood. And that has not only a literal meaning, but also the figurative meaning of your eternal life is found in the blood of Christ. It's found through the blood of Christ that he shed for you. The life is in the blood. And that is the most life-giving essence or whatever you know, that, that keeps our body alive is the blood. If you just do a physical study into blood, it is one of the most amazing aspects of the human body. And this is what just boggles my mind is how there can still exist atheists that think that everything happened by chance. Anytime you start studying real science, I mean demonstrable things that you can test, you can demonstrate, you can reproduce, you can look under a microscope, you can look into things that actually exist, and you start looking into the intricacies of how our human body works or how any living organism works. It is profoundly complicated and it is absolutely amazing and gives just, there is no doubt that an intelligent designer was involved in the creation of us as human beings. One little, just a, a few facts about blood. So blood contains hemoglobin. Hemoglobin, to the best of my understanding, and you know, someone will probably correct me if I'm wrong about this, is the most complicated molecule that is found naturally existing in the world. So when I say, if you know what a molecule is, you think back to chemistry, 
And you think of all the, the, the elements, right? And they have little numbers by them. So like a molecule for water, the water molecule is H2O, right? It's got the big H, little two, and the O. That's a molecule. Molecule is a collection of, of those elements. Well, in our blood, there's like carbon and nitrogen and iron and I believe sulfur. I'm not, I'm, I can't remember. There's like four or five elements, except instead of like H2O, it's like C1456, you know, N, you know, whatever, like, like really large numbers. But then iron is like four parts. So it's a very, 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 very small amount of iron in a hemoglobin uh, molecule. Now, stay with me, okay? I know I'm, I hope I'm not boring you too much. I get too nerdy on you, but it's actually really amazing what happens. Part of the process, the, the whole purpose of our blood is to be a delivery system for our body of everything that your body needs in order to survive. So, you know, obviously we breathe air. Oxygen is necessary for the rest of our body to function. Uh, other organs flesh, everything with our body, we need that oxygen. Well, that oxygen comes in in the form of air, but it's not like you have a bunch of air running through your bloodstream. So the air has to be converted into a solid. So you have a gas being converted into a solid or a liquid going through your system and then all of the element, and, and it's not just the oxygen. There's, there's, <laughs> Everything that your body needs, without going really deep into every single aspect, is being delivered to the rest of your body through the blood and is being pumped through by the heart and you've got things coming and going. And not only is it delivering things, it's also removing things. So it's, it's delivering the good stuff, eliminating waste, and just back and forth, every single beat of your heart, every single breath that you take, every single instant, there are millions or billions or however many little transactions of each molecule performing its job within your body. And I mentioned that there's iron in the hemoglobin. One of the things that the iron does is in, in the process of transferring, um, iron rusts. When iron oxidizes, it rusts. Well, the body is able to make that oxidation happen and then reverse that so that it's basically like rusting and unrusting within your body in order to do all the transfers that are necessary within your body. Not only that, the shape of the, the red blood cells is mathematically proven to be the most efficient shape for it to do its job because there's a lot of things that need to be done. One is that it needs to be able to be very fast in the delivery of these nutrients because it's shooting through your veins very quickly. And as it's going through, it needs to be delivering stuff to your body. It doesn't like get to some destination. It's working on the fly as the blood's pumping through your system. So these cells are, are doing what they need to do as they travel through the body. It needs to be fast. It needs to be able to carry, you know, maximize the amount of, of you know, call it nutrients. I know it's not just every nutrients, but what, what needs to be delivered. And what's very interesting about that is the shape is, imagine a disc, it's a round disc, but then it's concave in on both sides. It's a very interesting shape. But mathematically, for everything that the, that the blood cells need to do, it is the absolute most efficient way. Even if you were just to come up with what would be the most, just, just starting from scratch and say, this is what this needs to do. We need to maximize surface area. We need to maximize volume. And it needs to be able to travel through blood and, you know, and, and all these different things. That is the most efficient shape. And it just so happens to be what exists in our body right now. And it, it's, it's, uh, there's so many amazing facts about the way that our body works. And you, you, you look, you start delving in deeper and deeper into these things. It just brings more glory unto our creator. The amount of wisdom, the amount of, of just, it's, it's awe inspiring. And then, you know, I encourage everyone not to be a dummy. Learn things, study things. You know, obviously learn the Bible, study the Bible, know the Bible. That's the most important thing. But 
it's good to learn other things, learn science, learn math, learn history, learn, you know, learn. God wants you understanding and knowing things. And the more you look into stuff, the more you're going to end up seeing God's fingerprint on it anyways. It truly is amazing. Now, what happens in our blood, it's bringing life to our body. And of course, the teaching we have is um, symbolic as well as um, literal. Turn to Leviticus chapter 16, just one, one page back in your Bible maybe. I'm going to read from you for, for you from Genesis chapter 9. Genesis 9, 3 says, Every moving thing that liveth shall be meat for you, even as the green herb have I given you all things. This is after the flood, when God just says you're allowed to basically eat anything. You eat animals, you can eat vegetables. It says, But flesh with the life thereof, which is the blood thereof, shall ye not eat. So all the way back to Genesis, he's saying, you know, this isn't some uh, restriction about eating blood, like a dietary restriction that only goes back to Moses. This goes all the way back to Noah when he's allowing them to eat, to eat flesh, eat animals. He's saying, don't eat the blood. This is something that would continue today. While we don't have the same dietary restrictions that you'll find in the book of Leviticus on many animals that are called unclean, that has been lifted. The, it is still, you still should not be eating blood or drinking blood. That is still off limits is something that we ought not to be doing. And it says in verse 5, And surely your blood of your lives will I require. At the hand of every beast will I require it. And at the hand of man, at the hand of every man's brother, will I require the life of man. Whoso sheddeth man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed. For in the image of God made he man. And this is where God puts the death sentence on someone who would murder someone else. And it's referring to that murder as shedding their blood. Because when, when you shed someone's blood, they bleed out and die because the blood is, is, has your life, has the life of your flesh in it. Uh, Leviticus 16, look at verse number 6. The Bible says, And Aaron shall offer his bullock of the sin offering, which is for himself, and make an atonement for himself and for his house. And he shall take the two goats and present them before the Lord at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And Aaron shall cast lots upon the two goats, one lot for the Lord and the other lot for the scapegoat. And Aaron shall bring the goat upon which the Lord's lot fell and offer him for a sin offering. But the goat on which the lot fell to be the scapegoat shall be presented alive before the Lord to make an atonement with him and to let him go for a scapegoat into the wilderness." And Aaron shall bring the bullock of the sin offering, which is for himself, and shall make an atonement for himself and for his house, and shall kill the bullock of the sin offering, which is for himself. And he shall take a censer full of burning coals of fire from off the altar before the Lord, and his hands full of sweet incense beaten small, and bring it within the veil. And he shall put the incense upon the fire before the Lord, that the cloud of the incense may cover the mercy seat that is upon the testimony that he die not. And he shall take of the blood of the bullock and sprinkle it with his finger upon the mercy seat eastward. And before the mercy seat shall he sprinkle of the blood with his finger seven times. Now, I'm going to pause right here real quick. This, in the book of Leviticus, you're going to find all kinds of different sacrifices, sin offerings, free will offerings, all kinds of different things. What we're going over right now is something that happens once a year. And he's entering into the most holy. So the way that the tabernacle was set up is that you had the holy place and then the most holy place. So it was kind of like an inner chamber. It was like a temple within the temple, if you will, that was the most holy place. So a lot of things happened in the, in the temple at large that it was still restricted for the priests to go in and do their job and to do their duty. It's not like everyone was able to just go in, but the most holy place was off limits that the high priest went into once every year that would offer the offering for the sins of the people and, and for himself even to enter into that place. He had to offer up one bullock, 
that's going to, you know, the blood's going to be shed for him to enter into there. And then he could um, have the offering for the sins of the people. We're going to, and this is, this is what we're talking about here. And this is what's referenced also in the book of Hebrews, and we're going to get to that in a minute as well. But we're going to first read through Leviticus 16, and there's so much symbolism already going on here, even with the incense coming before the mercy seat. Oftentimes you'll see, you know, incense and, um, you know, prayers going up to God and the mercy, you know, ascending to the mercy seat. And then, um, the blood being sprinkled. So here in verse number 14, it says, he shall take of the blood of the bullock and sprinkle it with his finger upon the mercy seat eastward. And before the mercy seat shall he sprinkle of the blood with his finger seven times. Then shall he kill the goat of the sin offering that is for the people and bring his blood within the veil and do with that blood as he did with the blood of the bullock and sprinkle it upon the mercy seat and before the mercy seat. So First, he brings in the blood for himself to even be doing this stuff. The blood is shed for him to do anything he's doing. Then for all the people, he's bringing blood and basically doing the same thing. And notice he's going within the veil. Now, of course, when Jesus Christ died on the cross, the veil was rent in twain. And that was breaking down that partition between the holy and the most holy place. We don't need a priest to go in and make an offering for our souls today because Jesus Christ fulfilled that when he was the offering, the final offering, the only one that really would satisfy our sins anyways, breaking down that, that middle partition. Again, there's so much symbolism. I, I can't spend too much time on all of these things because each one individually has a lot to learn from them. But let's keep going here in verse number um, 16. And he shall make an atonement for the holy place because of the uncleanness of the children of Israel and because of their transgressions and all their sins. And so shall he do for the tabernacle of the congregation that remaineth among them in the midst of their uncleanness. And there shall be no man in the tabernacle of the congregation when he goeth in to make an atonement in the holy place until he come out and have made an atonement for himself and for his household and for all the congregation of Israel. And he shall go out unto the altar that is before the Lord and make an atonement for it and shall take of the blood of the bullock and of the blood of the goat and put it upon the horns of the altar round about and he shall sprinkle the blood upon it with his finger seven times and cleanse it and hallow it from the uncleanness of the children of Israel. So again, we're seeing blood being used as a cleansing, washing away the, the uncleanness of the children of Israel. Verse 20, And when he hath made an end of reconciling the holy place and the tabernacle of the congregation and the altar, he shall bring the live goat. And Aaron shall lay both his hands upon the head of the live goat and confess over him all the iniquities of the children of Israel and all their transgressions and all their sins, putting them upon the head of the goat and shall send him away by the hand of a fit man into the wilderness. And the goat shall bear upon him all their iniquities unto a land not inhabited. And he shall let go the goat in the wilderness." Turn to Hebrews chapter 9. The amount of times Jesus Christ is represented in these things is just incredible also. From the veil, going into the veil, from each one of these offerings, of course, Jesus Christ is the perfect Lamb of God that shed His blood in order to, to make the atonement for our sins. But also even this, um, the scapegoat, is another reference of Jesus Christ. It's another aspect of our salvation. It's another way to help us to understand what Jesus did for us. Going all the way back to when they bring two goats and they cast lots and basically one of them's chosen to live and the other one's chosen to die. And the one that is, you know, the blood is shed basically allows for the other one to be able to go free. And this is one great picture of our sal salvation. Jesus Christ substituted himself and took all of our, you know, was able to shed his blood so that we can go free. But when you, and that's, again, these symbolic references, um, there's many applications for them. They don't all follow all the way through because when you look at it from that standpoint, it's not like we just keep our sins and just go wander in the wilderness. The scapegoat also represents Jesus Christ in the sense that he has taken our sins 
and removed them from us as far as the east is from the west. So he's taken all of our sins that we own upon himself and has just taken them away to be just gone out in the wilderness, is basically just, just gone out from us forever, never to be mentioned again, never to be heard or seen from again. God has, has forgiven us of our sins and separated us from them as far as the east is for the rest through Jesus Christ being that offering, being that scapegoat, taking our sins to hell and shedding his blood on the cross to pay for them. So many great references here, all pointing to Jesus Christ. Hebrews chapter 9, we're going to see now in the New Testament the reference back to what we just read in Leviticus. Verse number 7 is where we're going to start reading. The Bible says, But into the second went the high priest alone once every year, not without blood which he offered for himself and for the errors of the people. The Holy Ghost, this signifying, that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest while as the first tabernacle was yet standing. So he's explaining from based on what was happening before, what was going on. He says, into the second, that's, that's the, the most holy place. He says, only the high priest went there once every year. And he said, not without blood. Again, it's just making sure you understand it's not without blood. You're not, he was not able to make it into the holy place without blood. There had to be shedding of blood. I'm making a big deal about this also because there are people out there that will claim that the blood really isn't that important. You'll see the blood references being removed from modern translations. You've got people like John MacArthur who will say, oh, well, the references to the blood is just a euphemism for his death, that Jesus just had to die, and that the actual blood really doesn't have that much significance. Uh, no, John MacArthur, it actually has a lot of significance. Now, he said that a long time ago, and there was a big deal made about it, like probably 20 years ago, but he's never changed his position on it either. And there's still a lot of people that look to him as some great resource and some great reference. And the guy is a heretic. Amen. If you're going to deny the blood of Jesus Christ as being not that important, that's pretty blasphemous. I'm sorry. That's, that's, he's a heretic for, for even suggesting that. I don't know how you could read through the scripture. There's so many ways that it's mentioned about the blood being shed and the blood being the atonement and that the blood has to be there and that there was never any forgiveness without the shedding of blood. And we're going to see in a minute how the first covenant was not made without the shedding of blood. Neither was the second covenant. They all had to have blood. And you can see it literally physically happened. There was literal blood being shed in that first covenant. It wasn't just referring to the death of the animals, of the goats. So the, then if, if it was just a death, then why are they sprinkling blood? Why are they pouring out the blood in the manner that they did ritualistically? Why would that even be important if it's just about the death? Of course the blood matters. Why would, it, why would the Bible invest the time of saying, look, the life is in the blood? If the blood just really doesn't matter, it's really just his death. Well, no, it's not just the death that matters, it's the life also. The life of Jesus Christ matters as much as his death matters. Let's keep reading. He's not the only one that will say these things, but you've got to watch out for the, for the heretics. And if we're not being real strong and taught on this stuff and looking into the Bible and studying these things, it's going to be a lot easier to fall for the, the people out there who are lying in wait to deceive. So in verse 8, the Bible says that the Holy Ghost was signifying that the way into the holiest of all was not made manifest. So it wasn't made manifest. It wasn't known yet. That's why the high priest was only allowed to go in there once every year, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the errors of the people. Way of the Holy Saul was not made manifest while as the first tabernacle was yet standing. So as long as that first tabernacle was in effect, you had the Levitical priesthood, you had these offerings going on, that's the way it had to be done. Verse number nine, which was a figure for the time then present. So at that time, it was a figure. It was an imagery. It was instructing them. 
It wasn't literally taking away their sins and atoning for their soul of getting, receiving eternal life by the blood of bulls and of goats. The blood of the bull, the blood of the goat that was being shed did not wash away anybody's sins. It was a figure for the time then present. And I've run into actually quite a few people who just don't have very much knowledge or understanding of the Old Testament. And they think that people were saved by keeping the law in the Old Testament, but thank God we're in the New Testament now and he's done away with that. No, people were never saved by keeping the Old Covenant because that's why we needed a New Covenant because it was impossible for them to keep the Old Covenant. They couldn't do it. Salvation has always been the same way. That's why even everything that they were doing was just a picture. It was representative. It was teaching truths. It was letting them know that there was going to be this ultimate sacrifice that would finally be done for all sin. And that's where their trust was. It wasn't in the specific bull that they was born out of their flock and, and that they offered up as a sacrifice. Verse 9, again, which was a figure for the time then present in which were offered both gifts and sacrifices that could not make him that did the service perfect as pertaining to the conscience. Your conscience, knowing that you've done wrong, knowing that you've sinned, just offering that goat, that doesn't, that doesn't make it clear. That doesn't wipe away your sins. Verse 10, which stood only in meats and drinks and divers washings and carnal ordinances imposed on them until the time of reformation. So yes, these things were imposed, but it wasn't to save their soul. It was a picture. It was, it was uh, instruction for the time then present until things were reformed, were, were, were modified, were changed. And that change came through Jesus Christ. When the priesthood was changed from being under the order of Aaron, where God ordained Aaron to be the high priest and his descendants and the children of, of the Levites, specifically the children of Aaron being in the priest role, to being Jesus Christ, the order of Melchizedek, which I'm not going to get into Melchizedek tonight, but um, that's the Reformation being referred to here in verse 10. Look at verse 11. But Christ being come in high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood. He entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. So the Bible is explaining here that he that Jesus Christ went into the temple, into the, excuse me, into the tabernacle. But not, it wasn't the same tabernacle that was on this earth it was a more perfect tabernacle not made with hands and if you remember the things that were made on earth in the old testament were patterns of the things that already existed in heaven there's a tabernacle in heaven and that tabernacle was mirrored here on earth and that's why god gave the the descriptions and the video you know, the, the understanding of how to create things that would show and be able to create on earth the things that already existed in heaven. The mercy seat already exists in heaven. The tabernacle already existed in heaven. Jesus Christ then, after his resurrection from the dead, was able to enter into the most holy by his own blood. And he only had to enter into the most holy place one time. He didn't have to do it year after year after year as they did in the Old Testament because what they did in the Old Testament, they kept showing a picture of what's going to come. They kept re reminding everybody, hey, this is going to come. This is what's going to happen. The Son of God is going to make the final, only real payment for our souls when He enters into the most holy place and sprinkles His blood on the mercy seat. It says, having obtained eternal redemption for us. Verse 13, for if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of an heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctify it to the purifying of the flesh. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? So many things just mentioned in that one verse. Again, the blood of Christ being mentioned there. How many times are we seeing the blood, the blood, the blood pop up? It's going to keep popping up more and more and more. We're going to see a lot of references to that. 
He offered up himself without spot. He was without blemish. He was perfect. He was sinless. There was no fault, no problem left in him. He had no broken bones. He had no other issues. When you read through the book of Leviticus, the priests, they couldn't be, um, uh, there's a lot of things it mentions, but they couldn't be a dwarf. They couldn't be crooked back. They couldn't have their stones broken. They couldn't have other issues. So these are all things that the Bible says. I'm literally telling you things that the Bible lists that, cannot, that the priest cannot be. The high priest cannot do these things and make offerings. God wouldn't allow it. He says they have to be essentially whole or perfect. They, you know, it wasn't talking about sinless, but they had to be whole in order to do that. Why? Because they're representing Jesus Christ. They're that image, that picture of Jesus Christ as going into the most holy place. So they had to be a proper representation of Christ. Just like the Passover lamb had to be a lamb without blemish. They had to look at it, inspect it, and say, okay, is this a good lamb? You couldn't just give God your scraps. You couldn't get some sickly lamb, some lamb that was basically just not that good, and, and offer that up. No, it had to be a good lamb. It had to be a perfect lamb. No blemish, no spots, because it represents Jesus Christ. So he offered up himself without spot, purge your conscience. Remember, we read earlier that the blood of the bulls and goats, they can't purge your conscience. They couldn't do away with your sin from your conscience, but Jesus Christ could. The blood of Christ absolutely could. Uh, verse number 15, and for this cause, he is the mediator of the New Testament, that by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the First Testament, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. The promise of eternal inheritance was already made. He had to do what he did in order for that inheritance to be given, for that, for that inheritance to be followed through with. Um, that's what that's saying there. Verse number 16, For where a testament is, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. For a testament is of force after men are dead. Otherwise, it is of no strength at all while the testator liveth. Whereupon, look at this, verse 18, Neither the first testament was dedicated without blood. Again, back to the reference of blood. Now, it did talk about a death, right? It says, well, in order for a testament to really have force, there has to be the death of the testator, the one speaking, dies, and then that testament really gets cemented. And that is referring to the death, but it's not just the death because that first testament was dedicated with blood. Verse 19, For when Moses had spoken every precept to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of calves and of goats with water and scarlet wool and hyssop and sprinkled both the book and all the people, saying, This is the blood of the testament which God hath enjoined unto you. This is the blood of the testament. We have an Old Testament. We have a New Testament. You know, another word for testament is covenant. There is an Old Covenant and a New Covenant. Old Testament, New Testament, they're synonymous. You use them interchangeably. And when you have the blood being shed, that is what um, sanctified or, or, or kind of dedicated each testament. The first testament was dedicated with the blood of bulls and of goats. The better testament, the second testament, the new testament was sanctified with the blood of Jesus Christ. It was dedicated with the blood of Christ. Verse 21, Moreover, he sprinkled with blood both the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry. Um, flip over to... Actually, no, stay in Hebrews 9. I'm going to read for you from Exodus 24. Uh, verse number 6 in Exodus 24 reads, And Moses took half of the blood and put it in basins, and half of the blood he sprinkled on the altar. And he took the book of the covenant and read in the audience of the people. And they said... All that the Lord hath said will we do and be obedient. And Moses took the blood and sprinkled it on the people and said, Behold, the blood of the covenant which the Lord hath made with you concerning all these words. So if you wanted to go back and read more about that, it's found in Exodus 24 where that first testament is being dedicated with the blood by Moses. And what did they say? All that the Lord hath said will we do and be obedient. Did they keep that covenant? No. That is the first covenant. And it was sanctified with blood, but it was sanctified with the blood of bulls and of goats. The second covenant, which says, 
faith in Jesus Christ. He's the, he's the Lamb of God. That was sanctified with the blood of Christ, and that is something that we can keep because it's easy to do. It's not hard. It's not by obeying the law at all. Let's keep reading in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 22. And almost all things are by the law purged with blood. And without shedding of blood is no remission. It doesn't say without death there's no remission. It says without shedding of blood. There is no remission. There is no taking back those sins. There is no other payment for those sins. That's why just like when someone is killed, their blood is shed. Hey, their blood needs to be shed. The blood is precious. The blood is extremely valuable. There's life in that blood. And when you take away that life, hey, that needs to be dealt with appropriately. And that's why the, the blood is shed. And when we um, have separated ourselves from God through our sin, well, in order for those sins to be remitted, there needs to be a shedding of blood for those as well. Um, verse number 23 says, It was therefore necessary that the patterns of the things in the heavens should be purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. Again, one more reference explaining that there really is heavenly things, heavenly tabernacle. It's not just something that existed here on earth because I've heard people try to deny, oh no, there's no tabernacle in heaven. Absolutely there is. You better believe it was a pattern. The pattern that was done down here was representative of what was done in heaven. And yeah, there was the blood of bulls and of goats being shed down here on this earth. That's not what was being shed in, in heaven. That's not what was being offered in heaven. There was a better sacrifice that needed to be made. And that was done one time. And that was with the blood of Jesus Christ, of course. Verse number 25. Nor yet that he should offer himself, or excuse me, verse 24. For Christ is not entered into the holy places made with hands, which are the figures of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Nor yet that he should offer himself often as the high priest entereth into the holy place every year with the blood of others. For then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world. But now once in the end of the world hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And as it is appointed unto man once to die, but after this the judgment, so Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. It's likening it to, hey, we're going to have one death, and then there's a judgment. Jesus Christ made one payment. One death was made for him to satisfy what we lack or what we owe, where we would be coming forward before God at the judgment. That one transaction is all we need. It's not a continual thing. He made it once for all. Let's switch gears a little bit. Turn to Exodus chapter 12. We're going to read a little bit here about the Passover. And again, we're going to look at the, the importance of the blood being shed and the importance that blood plays in our salvation and the symbolism and everything. That, that this is something that we cannot just overlook. I think it's also easier to overlook the blood in the New Testament and the significance and the importance of it because we don't have all of the, the Old Testament sacrifices. I think the fact that the, the blood was required was a lot easier for people to understand. Um, these days, people have a very strong aversion to even seeing blood, right? A lot of people don't even want to see blood. That used to be a pretty normal part of life when your food sources and things were more hands-on before the Industrial Revolution, before food just being shipped everywhere and you could just have everything now delivered to your doorstep. It's all been processed. It's all been taken care of. All of the dirty work has been taken care of. 
all you got to do is just hand over some money and you get to eat. That's not always the way things have been. Even if you didn't own your own animals to slaughter or whatever, it was still something that people were pretty well aware of and would see on a normal basis that there's a slaughterhouse. And what happens at the slaughterhouse? Well, the animals are slaughtered and you can see how that happens. And I remember years ago when I, uh, when I killed my first elk and I posted the pictures up on Facebook. And I posted up the pictures because I, you know, it was me gutting the animal and skinning it and, you know, it was hanging up by a tree. I thought it was cool. <laughs> Not everybody thought it was cool. I, a lot of people, you know, complaining that I would put some, such a thing up for everyone to see. And I was just like, this is normal. Like, this is, this, how do you think you eat the food? And it wasn't just by, like, vegetarians or something that, that were concerned about the animals. It's just people that eat meat, but it's like, I don't want to see that. It's easy to forget that through the death of these animals, that there's, there's blood being shed. It's very bloody. What Jesus did for us was very bloody. His blood was shed, literally pouring out from his body. It was a mess. It's not a pleasant sight, but it was necessary. We cannot overlook the importance of the life that was given for us, even just the physical blood coming out of the body of Jesus Christ. Let's look at the Passover, Exodus chapter 12, verse number 7. The Bible reads, And they shall take of the blood and strike it on the two side posts and on the upper door post of the houses wherein they shall eat it. This is the blood of the lamb. They're taking the blood that was shed when they offered up that sacrifice of the lamb. They, they, they pour out the blood into a container and then they would take the blood and put it on the doorposts just all over the door frame of the house. They would go up on each side and this way. And you notice even just by doing the motion, it kind of gives you a visual representation of a cross just by the up and down on the doorposts, the cross, the top. Now, obviously, it's not a cross that they're doing, but just those motions kind of point to that direction. I thought that was pretty cool when I heard someone else preach on that. But um, this is what they're doing with the blood. They're literally applying it to their household. They're taking the physical blood and applying it to the household. And you know what God did when he sent the death angel to, to kill the firstborn son? He looked for that physical blood. John MacArthur wants to tell you that it's really not the blood that's that important. Then why is it that the angel was literally looking for blood? Because that's exactly what happened. If you didn't have that blood applied to your doorstep, to your doorposts, you're going to, someone's going to die. Let's keep reading here. Verse 8. And they shall eat the flesh in that night, roast with fire and unleavened bread and with bitter herbs. They shall eat it. Eat not of it raw, nor sodden at all with water, but roast with fire, with his head, with his legs, and with the pertinence thereof. Again, I'm not going to go into this, but this is just you know, one more symbolic reference. Jesus Christ is the Lamb of God. Why does he take the time to say, nope, roast with fire, no water, not sodden with water, it has to be roast with fire? Because Jesus Christ's soul went to hell. Now, of course, we're, we're relying on the blood of Jesus Christ to make the atonement, but you know what? This had to happen too. This is part of it. They put the blood on their doorposts, but then they better make, you, they made sure that they're roasting that, that flesh with fire. Verse number 10, And ye shall let nothing of it remain until the morning. And that which remaineth of it until the morning ye shall burn with fire. They're supposed to eat the flesh. Remember Jesus Christ saying, if you don't drink my blood and eat my flesh, you have no life in you. More symbolism. It's more representative of, of Jesus Christ here. Look at verse number 11. And thus shall ye eat it with your loins girded, your shoes on your feet and your staff in your hand. And ye shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover for I will pass through the land of Egypt this night and will smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast. 
and against all the gods of Egypt I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. And the blood shall be to you for a token upon the houses where ye are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. He needs to see the blood. And if you want to be saved from the wrath of God, you need to have the blood of Jesus Christ applied to you. Uh, flip over to chapter, or well, you're in chapter 12. Jump down to verse number 21. The Bible says, Then Moses called for the elders of Israel and said unto them, Draw out and take you a lamb according to your families and kill the Passover. And ye shall take a bunch of hyssop and dip it in the blood that is in the basin and strike the lintel and the two side posts with the blood that is in the basin. And none of you shall go out at the door of his house until the morning. For the Lord will pass through to smite the Egyptians, and when he seeth the blood upon the lintel and on the two side posts, the Lord will pass over the door. It will not suffer the destroyer to come in under your houses to smite you. The blood, the blood, the blood, the blood. Now, how this, we saw a lot of the blood in the Old Testament. We also read Hebrews 9. But I'm going to... Um, you don't have to turn to all these references. Turn to Romans chapter 3. I'm just going to close in going through some New Testament references to the blood. Matthew 26, 27 says, And he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of it, for this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. Without the, remission, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. Remember that statement? Well, Jesus Christ himself said, this is my blood which is shed for the remission of sins. His blood had to be shed. And the, and the cup that he was giving of that juice, of that wine, was representative of his blood. He said, I want you to eat this bread and to drink this cup and it's representative of Christ coming until he, in, until he comes. And I'm going to go more in depth on this when we, um, when we do our uh, Lord's Supper communion here. And I'll explain more about, about the way that we're going we're to observe that and practice that here. And I'll get into that in a lot more detail. But just as they had the Passover lamb sacrificed in the Old Testament... We have the Lord's Supper to practice today to help us remember the body and the blood that was broken and shed for us. And that is our remembrance to make sure that we keep on talking about this stuff and we keep on thinking about this and we don't ever forget what Jesus did and what needed to be done for us, that the blood had to be shed. John 6, 53, the Bible says, Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Except ye eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, ye have no life in you. Whoso eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life. And I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood dwelleth in me and I in him. Again, another reference to the blood being pretty important. Um, Acts chapter 20, verse 28, the Bible says, Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. Jesus Christ purchased the church with his own blood. Romans chapter 3, you're in, you should be in Romans 3, look at verse number 25. Whom God hath set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood. What are we trust in? Faith in the blood of Christ. To declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. What are you saying you have faith in? Faith in the blood. Faith in the, in the shed blood of Jesus Christ to pay for our sins. Flip over to chapter 5. The Bible just is, is full of these references. And I don't have all the references of blood. I just picked some of them out. There are plenty more references than what I'm giving you tonight. But I, I have as much in here as I feel is, is going to do some justice to see this isn't just one verse. No, this is a major theme in Scripture with very, very clear statements that you can't just brush aside 
and say, well, no, you, you know, I think that's kind of a stretch. That is not really what it's saying. How many times does it need to say the same thing? Romans 5, 8, but God commendeth his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us much more than being now justified by his blood. We shall be saved from wrath through him. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. And then basically the same thing is repeated in Colossians chapter 1. Verse 14, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. And once again, in verse number 20, and having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself, by him I say, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. It's important to recognize and understand that Jesus Christ's blood needed to be shed for the atonement of our sins. It's the way that God designed it. Even if you say, well, I don't understand. Why did the blood have to be shed? Well, that, that's the way that things are and were going all the way back to creation, going all the way back to Genesis. Hey, when man's blood shed, is shed, then it needs to be shed by, some, by man. When someone murders blood, blood needs to be made as the atoning factor to, to offset that blood. When we sin against God, there's no forgiveness. There's no remission of those sins without the shedding of blood. And through all of that, it's important to understand the difference between the Old Testament and New Testament. People get into all kinds of weird doctrines. This dispensationalism is nonsense. People that think that anyone was ever saved by the blood of bulls and goats, how much does that cheapen the blood of Jesus Christ? If the blood of bulls and of goats could save, then why did Jesus need to come? Why don't we just continue and as well as just keep offering these sacrifices because it's good enough? It was never sufficient. It was always a picture. It was always a figure. Don't let anyone try to spin your head around and say, oh no, things were different then and, and that's how people got saved. They were saved by keeping the law and then in the future, people are going to be saved by keeping the law during the tribulation period and then there's all these different ways of getting saved. You know what? If someone comes along and preaches another gospel which you have not received, let them be accursed. Let them be accursed. There's not a different gospel for Adam and a different gospel for Abraham and a different gospel for Moses and a different gospel for John the Baptist and a different gospel in the tribulation. There's one gospel. There's an everlasting gospel. It's the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's right. Amen. It's always been the only way people got saved. It's always been by grace through faith. Right. That's right. Understand the symbolism. Understand what's there. Shedding of blood had to happen, but that blood that was being symbolized was the blood of Jesus Christ. Let's bow our heads have a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you so much, so much for the blood that was shed to cover us, to wash us from our sins, Lord. We are forever indebted to you. God, thank you for showing so much love that, that you've bestowed upon us. God, help us to walk worthy of that, that great gift that you've already given to us, Lord. Help us to, to show honor and respect. Help us to be pure in our doctrine, Lord, and not to get too um, just off track or skewed in our understanding of Scripture and that we wouldn't, you know, in our zeal to fight false doctrines, get off of just, just good and, and, and clean truth from your word, Lord. Help us to... Um, Keep these things in remembrance. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.